This is a production of the Greater West Bloomfield Historical Society and Civic Center TV. Well first, let me welcome you to my fire. My name is Mikwanden. In Anishinaabe Moan, it means he who remembers traditions. Secondly, let me welcome you to Apple Island, a place that is sacred to my people and many people that were indigenous in this country to begin with. I'm here today to explain to others why islands, are so sacred to our people that we want to hold on to them and they are near to us and they will always remain near to us. All islands, especially Inland Lake Islands, are especially important. And when we begin to think about the symbolism that they represent, it's very easy to see why. You see, our people believe in the Mother. Mother Earth gave birth to all things, all things came from the same planet, the same earth. So we treat her with respect. And if you know anything about birth, you know that when the head crowns in the birth channel, that there is water breakage and that water comes out and it surrounds the head. This is why islands are so sacred to the Anishinaabe and to all the people that were here long before the Wabishi showed up. It is also important to understand that these places are a place of sanctuary. Once birth is given, uh, to this day, even on Apple Island in May, oftentimes we find that the deer have crossed over from the busy streets and all the noise and everything that exists on the other side of the island, away from the civilization. You know, They come here to give birth, and it is often that we see the does and the fawns here. Now we chase them up when we come and visit, but in a way, I think they know that they are safe, especially for someone uh, of my background and of my people. It is important to understand too, that when we're on a place that's sacred, I will take nothing, nothing from this place, but the solace that, you know, I am here the very ground I camp on, on Apple Island, is a place that my ancestors rested their heads upon. Now, I did not know that the first time I came to the island. It's sort of a strange thing, but I was sort of dumped off on the island on a Friday night, and I was left there of my own devices. And I began to wander around the island a bit before I decided where I would pitch camp. And I walked around the island twice till I settled on a place. Now the reason I chose that place was one, it faced the west. There was a breeze that night, so it kept what mosquitoes and bugs were there out of the campsite. 
The other reason is a very simple one to my way of thinking. The Gabigishi Jishikin, the red cedar were growing there. You don't see them here in this place, but in the campsite they were there. It is one of the four sacred herbs that we honor. So I knew that sleeping there would offer me a peaceful night or a peaceful weekend of rest. I chose that site and I have camped there ever since. It has almost never failed me to have a peaceful night's sleep. It has guided me, it has honored me, and it only has done so because I stopped to ask the ancestors permission first. It is always important in a sacred spot to seek the right spiritual guidance. Since the ancestors were there proven by archeological digs, it was very important to me and to my ancestors that I sought out and acknowledged their presence there, and they are there. I could go on and on about stories, how they have affected me, and how I have slept there alone many nights. Now I sleep there with guests, temporary guests, if you will, the Wabishi come, they set up camp, still can tell my camp versus theirs. I leave and no one knows that I have been there except the ancestors. It is a very special place and I would encourage you, given the opportunity to come and visit Apple Island, every chance you get, every time you'll be there, it'll be a different experience. Well, according to archeologists, they began coming there very early on. I suspect that when the glaciers retreated, the island was formed and the water of the lake was filled in along with the springs that are found there. I suspect they began maybe not living there, but staying there overnight. Again, it's a, it's a safe place. It's a sanctuary for us from very early times, even though the evidence you know, archeologically speaking, may not be found there today. It would just be a natural habitat to go and stay and camp. Plus, there is the beauty of the island that would have been very appealing to my ancestors. The ancestors got to the island in a variety of ways, actually. They uh, could have gotten there through birch bark canoes because in those days, you know, before the highways and the condos and the speed boats, the fishermen and the pontoon boats, uh, the Orchard Lake was sort of a union of three different water systems. And uh, the Rouge River, the Clinton River and the Huron River, they all meet in the general area there. They could have portaged their canoes there's actually what I think, and I believe wholeheartedly, the place where they would have placed the canoes on one end of the island. That end of the island also faces where those three river systems come in, and it's a flat spot uh, with a hill behind it. Again, you have to come out. It's a beautiful place, and it's a perfect place to launch and to land your canoes. The other place, the other way they got there was there are many stories that when the Wabishi, when the white folks began to settle the area, that there was a place in those days where our ancestors could walk across on the bottom. Orchard Lake in many places is very sandy and they could walk. They may even have laid down a rock path. And there are stories of them placing their clothes and their goods on top of their heads and walking to the island. Again, if you're going to go there, it's a sacred place. It is also a sanctuary, so they would not have needed much to go there and stay for short periods of time. So there are a variety of ways they would have gone to the island. After all, it's really not even a far swim if you had to do that. And remember, we lived out here in the woods, so we would have been able to swim we definitely bathed, we were very clean, and it would have, they would have faced no real concern. Now the water level may have come up a bit since the old days,
because of all the drainage and things, you know, when we start to block rivers, we block streams, we change the courses or those sorts of things. So the lake may have even been shallower in those days. I cannot tell you that that's true, but I suspect that very much with all the concrete around it. It is extremely rare, uh, especially down this far south in, in the state, to have an island like that, uh, which again adds to its significance. We know that Mackinac Island, we know about Beaver Island, we know Drummond, we know those places were sacred. We find medicine wheels there. We find all kinds of archeological evidence. In my mind, there is no doubt, although this would have been sort of the southern end of the Anishinaabe territory, you would have had Potawatomi and Fox and Sauk. And again, because of the three river systems and the way, you have to think of a river as a super highway. In those days, that's the way we travel. Yes, we had trails, uh, but the river was fast. It was easy. We could portage a, 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 a birch bark canoe with no time. If we damaged the canoe, we, we knew how to fix it in a very short order. Uh, it would have been very easy to use that island for, for multiple purposes. And because of its size, it could hold a rather large group of traveling uh, ancestors. It would depend uh, on what they were doing. You know, in modern, more modern times, uh, you know, we know that Pontiac uh, may have stayed there. He may have been there because it was a perfect meeting place. I say may because there's no evidence of this at all. I, I have a tendency to believe uh, that, that it's a big maybe, uh, but it is an important place and they would have stayed there from days to weeks. Again, the archeologists have dug up the sites they found fish bones and fires and charcoal and things of that. So anytime that's being found, like if we go to fish camp, uh, we will stay there for the fish season, so to speak. Um, we may come and go, but in reality, as long as there's food, we're going to stay. And in the old days, I don't think we really know how the island was covered. We only see it in today's terms. You know, Apple Island because there was an orchard of apples there. Uh, in the old days, there may have been berries and roots and things to eat there. They may have planted corn there. We, we don't really know, I don't think. And uh, all of that is a possibility. Again, because it's an island and it's a rather large inland island, almost anything was possible for our people to do. It was not above us to, uh, to farm the island in small plots. There are stories that they continued to come uh, until the modern era. I think when they began to build houses and people began to summer vacation there, um, th that it, it made them stop. I think too there are more than one reason that, that people stopped coming to the island. I think a lot of it may have been because, you know, the, the buildup around the area and also a misunderstanding a bit about native culture. You know, we were moved around so much. Uh, everyone knows the Cherokee had a trail of tears, but the Anishinaabe also had a trail of tears. Uh, almost every major tribe east of the Mississippi was uh, forced to march uh, and many lives were lost. You know, it's a sad part of our history as the United States, and it's a sad part of our history as Anishinaabe um, that so many of us uh, were, for lack of a better word, uh, the practice of genocide occurred. Um, so I think it's a combination. Uh, a lot of people like myself are mixed blood. So, you know, it just started to fade from memory a bit. And I think the goal of the historical society and the goal of our people is to bring those memories back so that you know we can once again enjoy the history and we can share the history of these very sacred places and if i might just talk about sacred places a little bit i think everyone it doesn't matter what kind of blood you have in you're running through your veins everyone 
can feel the sacredness of a place. And if there's sacredness, there must also be evil. I have been in many places in the woods, you know, near my home in the Upper Peninsula when I was a child, as an adult in the middle of the state, roaming the woods. And there's just been places that I want to sit down and I want to just enjoy the quiet and the solitude and all the things that are going around me, whether they're ancient oak trees or it's just a beautiful spot in the woods. Those are your sacred places. And to balance it out, which we try to do, everything's in balance. There are evil places also. There are places that anyone who roams the woods will come to and you will be very uncomfortable in. It's almost as if something or someone was watching you. Those are the evil places. We avoid the evil places and we seek out the sacred places. And that's what makes Apple Island so special. I don't know of anyone who has ever come to visit me there or visit the island that has walked away saying, I will never come back here. Everyone wants to come back. Well, let me tell you a story about the island. Um, for my native brothers and sisters out there, I think you will not question this. Um, for others, it will seem like one of those moments of like, oh yeah, right, whatever. Uh, many years ago when I used to stay on the island by myself, I was awoken at three o'clock in the morning. And like I said, I've spent many years in the woods. And uh, my father always claimed that uh, he saw panthers. He saw the Milford Panther. He moved up to Atlanta, Michigan, uh, trying to get back up north more, and uh, he saw a panther go across the road. Years later, I became friends with a DNR agent, and I was relating that story to him. And my father, who lived north of the DNR station, uh, saw a panther, and without even hesitating, this officer said, he did. So I'm prefacing the story with those sorts of background so that you understand what happened. There is a deadfall of red cedar, Gabigishi Jishikin, um, next to where I camp, where the ancestors stayed. I heard breaking limbs and it woke me up. I was not frightened, but I definitely something was out there. Now, like I said before, there are deer there that come in and give birth. So it was not frightening at all except that while the branches were breaking, I heard a very distinct guttural growl. The next morning, I got up very cautiously and went over to where the deadfall was. And I began to track. Now I'm legally blind due to diabetes, which is a plague on native people but I could see the tracks. And when the president of the historical society came over that morning, I said to him, I want to show you something. And I showed him the set of tracks. It led to an erosion point on the hill. There were two tracks in the water, distinctly very clear, and then two that pushed off. He said to me, I don't remember dogs being here yesterday. And I said to him, there were no dogs. And he said, well, what are those tracks? And I said, did you notice any claws in those tracks? And he said, no. And I said, that's because they were retracted. He said, how do you know this? And I told him what had happened the night before. Now, the panther is a powerful omen. My father saw these panthers, as I said before. I cannot say for real that there was a panther on the island, flesh and blood. But whatever it was, it was a large cat because the tracks were that big. Remember, just the pads, no claws, not a dog. The, the claws were retracted. Again, I'm not going to say that it was a panther or a cat, but recently the DNR has come out in the Upper Peninsula and said that they have panthers. Now the same DNR agent that told me that my father had seen one has also told me they are in the Lower Peninsula also. Not to frighten anyone, because that's not the point. 
The point is for me, it was a very powerful moment in a very sacred place. For others, it may be just a oh poo hoo that didn't happen. But I know what I saw, I know what I heard, and I've spent enough time in the woods to know the difference. So yes, there, there are many stories uh, on that island. I'm sure that my ancestors could share many more. But may I share a legend with you? I would like to tell you the story of how we got fire, if you don't mind. You see, there was a time when the Anishinaabe were still young. And as a people, we didn't know everything yet. And Nana Bozo, this character that we have, he loved to give gifts to the Anishinaabe. And may I add that he loved the Anishinaabe people. He knew that our women were the finest women he knew that our men were brave and well, look at us. Are we not the most handsome men, sorry guys, in the whole world? He also knew that we were eating our food raw and that we were cold in the winter. He also knew that Grandfather North had the only fire around. So he told his grandmother, please gather some kindling, some small bits of wood, keep it in the wiki up. And when I return, I will be ready. And all we need to do is take the spark I bring back, throw it on the fire, blow gently on it, and the Anishinaabe will now have fire of their own to keep. Now, Donabozo, he could change himself into things. And he changed himself into a rabbit. In our language, the Wabus. Wabus was different looking in those days. Wabus had a long tail. He had pert little ears. He had legs and fur that were just beautiful. Now, he was fast and he could zag and zig as he ran. So he went north into the cold and he found Grandfather North's wiki up. Now, Grandfather North had two beautiful daughters and Nana Bozo hatched a plan. He knew exactly what to do. What he did is he faked like he was wounded. He knew that those daughters would pick him up like any girl would. And they would cuddle him and hold him and nurse him back to health. Only he was faking it. So he waited. Inside the wiki up, he waited until the right moment. He saw that in their pile of wood, they had pine wood. And he knew that when that pine would get on the fire, it would spark. And when it sparked and threw out a coal, he knew it was his chance, and he did exactly what he planned. He jumped in the way of that coal, and it landed on his tail, that long, beautiful tail. But the daughters were quick-witted, and they knew exactly right at that moment that was Nana Bozo. So what they did, the first one, they grabbed him by the ears, but Nana Bozo pulled and pulled and she pulled. And finally, when she let go, the ears were long and thin. The second daughter grabbed him by the hind feet, and she held on for dear life because she knew their father would be very upset if anybody got the fire. She pulled, Nana Bozo pulled, they pulled, 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 and the back legs began to stretch. Now Nana Bozo got away, and he ran as fast as he could, back to his grandmother's wiki up. And she had done as he asked. The fire, the kindling was there. He flicked his tail. And as he flicked his tail, that coal arched its way and fell right on the kindling. But when this happened, the rest of his tail fell off. Now you see, to this day, it is a very important role in our tribe, the fire keepers, the keeper of the fire, the flame, it's the original fire that came from Grandfather North. But alas, the poor rabbit, today he has long ears, awkward back legs that kick and push him, and his tail is nothing more than a little stub. So this is the story of how we got fire and Waboos. Well, that's why Waboos looks the way he does today. We have many stories like that. We tell these things for several reasons. 
We tell them to teach our children. We also tell stories to teach morals and lessons in life. You know, this lesson, Wabu sacrificed. The rabbit sacrificed himself for the Anishinaabe. Many of our stories talk about that sacrifice for our people. We're a blessed people. Uh, we're very grateful for Nanabozo and all the animals in the woods. That's why we respect those things. And remember, they all came from Mother Earth. She gave birth to all these things, as well as us. So we respect them as brothers and sisters. Even though today, we don't communicate with them like we used to. You see, there was a time when the animals could talk to us. But that's another story. I learned them because my grandfather, who was Anishinaabe, uh, he was a traditional Anishinaabe. He, he made sure that we learned things, that, that I learned the language as much as I know, uh, the traditions, the stories. Plus, I belong to the Crane Clan. I, I am a Bushinashi, and that is part of our contribution to the tribe. We learn these stories and we share them. The, the legends, the myths, the why, why are things the way they are. Um, so these stories, and I think also the combination that if you open yourself up in the woods, regardless of you know, what type of blood or where your ancestors came from, you will observe these things and you will soon get to know them. It's really a matter of opening yourself up and listening. I've heard say that God gave us one mouth, Creator, and two ears for a purpose. That's so that we may listen twice as often as we speak. Uh, it's very important when you're in the woods to listen. You know, from hunting to just hiking to anything you're doing there. Uh, you can hear the noises, you can hear the animals move, you may even hear your own heartbeat. There are all kinds of things that go on in the woods if you just take the time and pay attention. That's the important part. My beaded outfit, um, well, let me start out by saying this. I never wanted to be a beater. It was not my life's goal when I was a young man to uh, learn the art of beating. But my grandfather one day took me and said, you go learn beating, Mikwan Dan. I said to him, and I remember this very clearly, I don't want to learn to bead, that's woman's work. Um, if he were still here on this, on, in this place, he would have a different part of the story to tell. I think about three weeks later when I regained consciousness, he would say it was six weeks, um, he grabbed me, and I remember this by the ear, and dragged me to an aunt, an older woman in the tribe uh, at Bay Mill, and she taught me to bead. I, I didn't bead a lot growing up. As a teenager, we had moved down to the Detroit area. Um, it wasn't cool. Um, when I got diabetes, I was sick for so long, um, I still didn't bead. Uh, I, after I went on dialysis and got the transplant, I really started to bead more. Um, and uh, in honor of my grandfather, I have one picture of him on the, on the reservation, the reserve, the, the res, uh, of, of a sepia photograph. And his outfit is very much like the one I have on. Years later, I found a book on the internet and this pattern was there also. So it sort of ties in. Um, but again, the meaning behind the beadwork, while it may look very beautiful and pretty, there is some deeper symbolism in these things. If you look at the leg, it's very easy. We have the three hearts shaped objects that make one flower. If you are wondering who the Anishinaabe are, in the white man's world out there, beyond our own uh, belief systems, we are called the Chippewa, the Ojibwe, and the Ottawa or Andawa. 
All right, so those three make up this beautiful flower. If you look at the leaves, there are four lobes on the leaves. That is a very significant number in our culture. There are four directions, there are four seasons, there are four uh, groups of your age. All of these are represented by the number four and by colors. When you look at a medicine wheel, the Anishinaabe medicine wheel, you look at that and those things become very obvious. There are four sacred herbs. It just goes on and on with this. I don't want to get too much into it, but all of those things. So the outfit itself is a symbolism of all of those things. The grapes are very simple. They're fertility. They signify that the Anishinaabe are here today, despite, you know, the uh, introduction of of illnesses that, that devastated us despite war, despite being moved around, despite life on the res, all of those things. We're here today and we will be here tomorrow and into the future. Um, we truly believe there will come a time, um, our prophecies talk about this, where others will seek the knowledge that we had. Our job is to keep that knowledge and when the time is appropriate, to share it to save our mother earth. So the outfit is, is very symbolic of, of many things. Black, blue, dark blue, and the burgundy wool are very traditional colors for us. So my jacket, you can't see it right now uh, because I can't stand up, but on the back for my brothers and sister, there is the origin story of the turtle sacrificing his back, fully beaded. Uh, my outfit, when I danced at the National Pow Wow in Washington, uh, weighs about 40 pounds uh, with all the glass beads. Um, I learned very early to bring gallons of water. <laughs> it's very hot in Washington in August. Well, I have three bags on right now, but the one that is going to be most visible is a, is a bear bag, a McHugh, uh, bear in our language. Uh, there was a time when uh, we could, only native people could part out and possess a bear paw or parts. Uh, it's very symbolic to us. It gives us strength. Um, what I carry in this, what I will share with you is, I have some sacred herb in there I started the fire with. The other thing I carry in here is maple sugar for quick energy. We call these sometimes a possible bag and I guess the best way to summarize it is anything that can fit in there, anything possible can fit in there. There may be eating utensils, there may be a bowl, a plate, there may be uh, medicines, you know, band-aids, things of that nature. Whatever you feel is necessary on your journey, you can put in a bag. Uh, the bear bag is an animal bag, but if you look uh, very closely, I have created with this beadwork that I do, uh, different possible bags. So these are very bright, they're very beautiful, I think. Uh, again, the symbolism on them can be very obvious. This particular type here is called a beaver tail bag. It's called beaver tail because the flap somewhat looks like a beaver tail. The other bag I'm wearing, and these are all traditional patterns underneath it all. Sometimes these are called bandolier bags. Uh, this one is beaded again in a very traditional native or uh, Anishinaabe pattern and it has horse hair and cones added to it. Uh, a lot of times when we do ceremony or when we uh, are dancing, any kind of jingling noise uh, helps accentuate uh, our dance. If you want, you need to attend a powwow. There you will see all kinds of outfits from similar to mine to very buckskinish outfits, to very bright colored outfits. Uh, the regalia is beautiful, it's enticing, and each individual will make it to their desire and their wants um, within reason. Attend a powwow. It will tell you a lot about our culture. Uh, if you get the opportunity and are invited, dance in the circle. You will be better for it.
The decorations in the old days, the scarf would have come with the uh, French uh, voyageurs. The, uh, the silver you see there is actual silver that would have been given uh, because, well, we didn't trust coinage. You know, there wasn't bills, but I could trade the silver with others uh, for fur. And the Anishinaabe really controlled the Mackinac Straits. Even when the French came here, we were very powerful. We were one of the most powerful tribes. Even today, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, Ojibwe, and Atawa, and Dawa, we still are one of the most populated, other than the Diné, the Navajo. We are, uh, uh, there are many of us still. And uh, at that time, controlling the Straits of Mackinac, uh, well, that meant you controlled all the fur trade in Inner Canada. And uh, when we could do that, then uh, you know, we could trade for furs, our people did, and they would trade the French for the silver, which gave us, unfortunately, many of the Wabishi gifts, you know, metal pots, uh, knives, metal knives, and things like that, which were superior to the stone things that we had, tomahawks, axes, things of that nature. So again, part of the history of even Apple Island, you know, we see these, uh, the progression of, you know, the historic Wabishi as they came up and they began to conquer parts of Michigan. Um, you know, the British and the French, the Americans, the Long Knives, all of this. Unfortunately, in the end, it seemed like the Anishinaabe didn't fare very well. But the French are gone, the British are gone, and we're still here. So only history will tell, eh? Yeah, this would have been a traditional uh, headpiece for the time, the, for the outfit that I'm wearing today. Um, we can use hair roaches, which are, they look like mohawks, I guess, the best way to put it. There's porcupine, guard hair, and deer. Uh, I have one, it's 22 inches long. It's appropriate for a man of my size. Uh, we would have used, uh, Feathers, when given the opportunity, of course, the eagle feathers are very limited today. Um, the tribe and the federal government regulate the handing out of those things. Um, and it becomes very political, and I, I'm not going to broach that subject today. <laughs> it, it's a hotbed in a way. Now, I want to explain something to you, especially for my brothers and sisters. Uh, my moccasins are very different from other moccasins. Our moccasins are very different from other moccasins. They're actually called Chippeways. My family comes from Bay Mill, mostly Chippewa Indians, natives. I've been an Indian far longer than I've been a native. You know, that's what I was called as a child and as a young man and even a young adult in middle age. Now I'm a Native American. I think I'm still the same person, but it doesn't offend me either way. So Chippewas are moccasins. Chippewas is a tribe? No, they are Anishinaabe. Um, so you can see that in, uh, you know, all the languages we use, in the language we use, Anishinaabe Moan, I, uh, things can get very confused. Uh, the French, you wanted to use, you know, their language. The British wanted to use theirs. Americans theirs, and the Anishinaabe we wanted to use ours. So we end up with these sort of confused names. A Chippewa Indian native is an Anishinaabe. A Ottawa Ojibwe is still Anishinaabe. And Anishinaabe in our language means first man or sovereign man, no chauvinism. So the moccasins, they pucker in the center. And that's where we get Chippewa. Chippewa means to pucker in the center or to pucker. Um, so those sorts of confusions happen. And uh, we have learned to live with it. And, you know, as I always joke about the Chippewa, as long as the government was paying the money, giving us checks, we'll cash it, whatever they call us. So the knife. The knife is an interesting uh, a bit. Uh, usually a neck knife would be sometimes called a scalping knife. Um, there's a whole tradition about uh, that sort of uh, action. Um, some say that we did that before the, uh, the visitors, as my grandfather called the Wabishi. Uh, 
I really don't know about it. I'm not that old, but I'm not that old. Uh, it is called a scalping knife. This one is a very old knife. It is Damascus steel. It was my grandfather's and he gave it to me or he left it to me when he passed away in 1974. I have treasured this blade my whole life. Uh, the only time I've had to sharpen it and clean it up was once when I was with a, a friend of mine in a canoe and we tipped over in the Huron River. Uh, it has been wet, it has been rained on, and it has never rusted. There was something in the water in the Huron that uh, made it rust and I had to resharpen it for the first time. So that's the knife and again it's just got the beading pattern of you know the floral arrangement. Um, I did the sheath, uh, the knife, the old sheath was just a plain leather sheath. Uh, I have been offered a lot of money for the uh, knife and I will never give it up. It will eventually go on to my son. So those are the things. Now listen folks, I've taken up a lot of your time here. And so we must ask ourselves, you know, what was the purpose of all of this? Well, the purpose is really uh, to educate outsiders, the people that are outside the tribe, that are outside, that don't run into Native Americans, Indians, Anishinaabe, uh, Lakota, Nakota, Diné, whatever the tribe is, uh, the group of natives. It's really to educate you in that, in reality, while we may dress like this, if you run into me on the street in a store, you're not going to be able to, you're not going to see me dressed like this. Uh, even in a village situation, even um, before, you know, we were discovered, although we never really knew we were lost, um, we didn't dress in this kind of finery. Um, this would be ceremonial or for special occasions. We dressed like many so-called primitive people, um, but in reality, we're no different than anyone else or any other people. Uh, we still love, we, we still dislike things, we still uh, seek food and shelter and warmth, and uh, we, st we are no different than anyone else. Um, and if the truth be told, I am part Wabishi, I am part Anishinaabe, and I go to events uh, to represent part of me, my people, um, but I never deny the fact that I'm, I'm also white. Uh, I'm not ashamed of either one. I'm not ashamed of anything that I've done or said uh, as an Anishinaabe or as a Wabishi. Understand that other Anishinaabe may have different points of view and I respect that. All I ask is that they respect the view and the way I was brought up. It doesn't mean that I'm wrong or they're wrong. It just means that we are people and we share so much in common, even if we do have small differences. Um, I never try to overrepresent myself. I always try to tell the truth. It's just in my nature. And I think with most native peoples, especially at first contact, we didn't understand the deceptions. We didn't understand so much of what the Europeans were after that, uh, you know, in the end, we lost so much. And today, all I think we ask is that our culture uh, remain and that we relearn our languages. We relearn the ceremonies. We relearn the importance of being outside. And, I, and I, as I look around, and I see children, um, I understand very clearly that the outside sometimes isn't in their vocabulary, that living in the woods is a fantasy that old people regret they never took the opportunity to do. So I would encourage uh, everyone, no matter what their nationality or what their race, to get out and enjoy the woods. Enjoy places like Apple Island. Go seek those sacred places and avoid the evil places. And you will know them if you open yourself up to those feelings. When you do that, you'll be a far better person for it. Do not be afraid of the forest. Uh, there's very little to fear there if you know what you're doing 
And the only way you're going to ever know what you're doing is if you go experience the great outdoors. The Creator made us all, and He made all this around us. He didn't do it to harm us. He did it to help us. So it's our job to go out and enjoy His creation. If you can do that, then you live the life well. That's all I have to say.